Miguel de Cervantes, author of one of the most highly regarded literary works ever written, Don Quixote de la Mancha, wrote The Eyes, Those Silent Tongues of Love. Ponder that for a moment. That means our eyes speak as much as, if not more, our voices or words. We non-verbally send a message using our eyes. That brings us to the nonverbal code of oculesics, or the study of eye behavior or eye movement. Before we go much further, let me place the study of oculesics squarely where it belongs, in the larger nonverbal code of kinesics, or body movement. You use your body in a variety of ways to communicate, through facial expressions, gestures, posture, and of course, your eyes. But scholars believe, like Cervantes, that the eyes are extremely important, the most expressive feature of the human body, enough so that they warrant their own area of study called oculesics. When you communicate with your eyes, you are moving a part of your body, even if you aren't aware of it. And that eye movement, or even the lack of eye movement, can send a variety of messages. Let me give the usual caveat. This is a deeper look, not a comprehensive discussion of this area of study in nonverbal communication that you can find with a few well-placed clicks on your keyboard. Okay, let's go deeper into what oculesics is. Some scholars will define oculesics as eye contact. But remember that oculesics refers to a body movement. Sure, eye contact is a body movement, but so is avoiding eye contact, looking away from someone, or looking at a person's mouth instead of his eyes. And the pupils of your eyes dilate, which is another body movement that you're not able to control. You know this. This is a reason some of us cover our eyes with our hands or dark glasses to prevent others from knowing where we are looking and how we are looking. Oculesics cover who you look at, where you look, how long you look, and how you look. Remember that nonverbal behavior and our interpretation of it differs by culture. For example, in some Asian cultures, making long eye contact could be perceived as rude, while lowering your eyes when talking to a superior is a form of respect. It is also ambiguous. It can be misinterpreted. The wide eyes associated with fear can be confused with surprise and shame may be interpreted as sadness. Eye movement is continuous. It's how we know that you are avoiding looking at us rather than thinking you may not have seen us. And as everything else, we learn how to use our eyes to communicate and how to interpret the meaning of the eye behavior of others. Let's take a quick detour to Ekman and Friesen's categories of kinesics to see how many of them apply to oculesics. Emblems are body movements that stand for something else. The basic concept of eye contact could support that the eyes can be used as an emblem. We believe that if someone is looking at us, showing us their eyes, they are listening to us. We use our eyes to illustrate as well. We use them to embellish or add meaning to a story we tell. In terms of affective displays, all you have to do is remember Cervantes' description of the eyes as silent tongues of love. We show our emotions through our eyes, whether it be love, fear, boredom, or anger. Regulators, recall that we use our nonverbal communication to influence the flow of a conversation. When we look at someone, we communicate that we are listening and that they are to keep talking. If we want to add to the conversation, we use our eyes to tell the listener that we want to talk. And adapters, when we adapt to our environment, like quickly blinking our eyes to clear dust out of them. Remember as well that Paul Ekman's research focused on microexpressions, which occur within 1 25th of a second. Ekman says that when someone conceals an emotion, some leakage will occur, like a flash of anger in the eyes. Three areas that influence our interpretation of eye movement are length, intensity, and direction of gaze. Think about how long you look at someone or something. Of course, it varies, and like everything else, there are extremes. On one end of the scale, you would have no eye contact while on the other end, you would place continued staring. No eye contact, or eye avoidance, can be very distracting. If someone avoids looking at you, you may interpret it as embarrassment, deception, lack of interest, and so on. Darting eyes, where they look at you, then look away quickly, and then maybe back at you again, never really staying in one place very long, can be seen as a sign of insecurity, or that the person is looking for escape routes, they don't want to talk to you. 
Continued staring is unnerving. In fact, the term excessive staring is listed as a consideration in claims of sexual harassment. How long is appropriate? Again, cultural differences abound. A University College London study concluded that people feel comfortable when the eye contact lasts about 3.2 seconds, even longer if the person doing the looking appears trustworthy rather than threatening. We know that intensity of gaze communicates as well. All we have to do is look at the various cliches used to describe how people look at each other. We say, if looks could kill, her gaze softened. He looked sharply at her. His eyes were like flint. We describe eye gazes as leering, crazed, piercing, accusing, incredulous, lying. A popular song in the 1970s by the Eagles was titled, You Can't Hide Your Lion Eyes. I've even heard the word rapey used to describe a look. Where you look, direction, is also important. When we give someone a sideways glance, people think we are flirting. Again, direction of gaze can be a determining factor in sexual harassment suits. In Darlene Orlov and Michael Rumel's 1999 book, What Every Manager Needs to Know About Sexual Harassment, they specify eye contact should be with the eyes, not anywhere below the neck. Looking at someone's body parts can make them feel extremely uncomfortable and paves the way for a hostile environment claim. The direction of eye gazes has been further categorized into three types social, intimate, and power. Social gazing demonstrates comfort. You concentrate your gaze at the triangle from the eyes to the mouth. It is usually not perceived as aggressive. Intimate gazing is what you use when you want to be intimate with someone. This is the gaze that Orloff and Rumel warn us about using in the workplace. Your eyes are directed at the area from their eyes to their mouth, as in social gazing, but then dip lower to the body. If you want to show dominance or power, you tend to use power gazing, directing your eye contact to the triangle connecting the eyes and the forehead, avoiding looking at anything below, including the mouth. I mentioned earlier that oculistics includes pupil dilation. You probably know that your pupils enlarge or dilate when you are in darker light and constrict when you are in brighter light. You may not realize that the pupils of our eyes also dilate when we see something or someone we like. We want to drink it all in, which is why many advertisers enhance images of their model's eyes. It makes us think more positively about the product being highlighted. Before Photoshop, photographs were taken in low light, forcing the model's pupils to dilate. We've covered quite a bit, which should make this last section more of a summing up than new information. If, as some claim, the eyes are the most expressive part of the face and thus significantly affect communication, what might the eyes communicate? You know that our eyes communicate interest and attentiveness, which is why, if your mother was like mine, she told you to look her in the eyes while she lectured you so she could be sure you were paying attention. We've already covered that the amount and type of eye contact you make communicates how comfortable you are with a person. We believe, particularly in the United States, that direct eye contact communicates honesty and distrust those who can't seem to look us in the eyes or maintain eye contact. The cliche that the eyes are the windows to the soul addresses that our eyes show our emotions. Recall Ekman's research on microexpressions, which claims that even if you are trying to conceal how you feel, some emotional leakage will still occur. We use our eyes to express our desire to participate in a conversation or not which is why we look directly at someone when we want to be included in a discussion and avert our eyes when we see someone we don't wish to talk to. And we use our eyes to regulate the flow of conversation. When we talk to others and wish them to take their turn, we usually look expectantly at them and they know it's time for them to speak. Or we look away from someone to non-verbally communicate that the conversation is over. So there you go. In answer to the question, what do oculistics cover? we can confidently respond, the eyes have it. American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson described how the eye works in communication. An eye can threaten like a loaded and leveled gun, or it can insult like hissing or kicking, or in its altered mood, by beams of kindness, it can make the heart dance for joy.